the Spiritist Talk series promoted by the United States Spiritist Federation, which occurs every Saturday morning at 11 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time. I am again delighted to host today's talk by our dear speaker, Julio Cavallo, who will be presenting an intriguing and important theme in our lives, the usefulness of wealth. Before proceeding, I would like to ask everyone to please send in your questions for this morning's presentation using the chat window. Julio has reserved time to address your comments and questions once he concludes his presentation. Next Saturday, August 20th, we will have Marcio Lee speaking with us about a world of fraternity. That will be one for all of us to look forward to. For today, we are looking forward to an engaging time with our speaker, Julio Carvalho. He is the founder and co-director of the Spiritus Center Divine Light in Newark, New Jersey. He is also a member of the Tri-State Spiritus Federation, where he actively works in the Department of Public Speaking, providing training courses for Spiritus workers. Each year, he participates in the national and international congresses, representing the U.S. and the Tri-State Spiritus Federation. Professionally, he is licensed. He is a licensed clinical social worker with 20 years experience in public speaking in the field of mental health, group administration, and emotional well-being. He is also the founder of Eclectic Solutions Counseling, a psychotherapeutic agency that provides psychological intervention to children and families. He has a bachelor degree in biology and a master degree in social work from Keene University. This morning, Julio will speak to the theme of the usefulness of wealth. He will lead us through an analysis of our relationship with money and the influence it has on the material and spiritual aspects of our existence. Please give a warm welcome to our dear brother, Julio. Thank you so much, Bradley, for that warm and welcoming presentation. I wish that everyone, upon listening to our few words, are better equipped to overcome the challenges of life. Our title, as requested by our Federation, is The Usefulness of Wealth. Well, I decided to uh, break down this topic into six different sections in order to make it more feasible for us to understand. Although it's not intended to be a comprehensive conversation about this topic, just because it's, it's so broad, it's so extensive, uh, we're going to try to uh, summarize the most important points in order for us to have at least a superficial understanding of this uh, very important topic, uh, money, wealth, richness, in, riches into our lives. So I designed here a little PowerPoint so we can follow my train of thought. And we're going to break down into perception that we have of money, ambition as a natural law, the providential usefulness of riches, competing economic systems, trials of poverty and wealth, and examples of wealth individuals who promoted progress. So let's begin by the perception that we have of money. And uh, what is perception is how we see it. And how important it is our perception of anything? Well, that's because the way we see things it actually shapes the way we feel about it and the way we actually go into act upon it. And as a result of seeing, feeling, and acting upon it, we'll actually develop habits that will actually create our destiny. So perception is very important to everything. So what is the perception that we have of money? Well. Our perception of money was given to us by our upbringing, by those who were around us. 
And uh, these are just some of the uh, perceptions that we have. You know, when we look at people who are very wealthy, we say that they are filthy rich. Now, the word filthy is associated with something that it's dirty, that it's illegal. Uh, we also have heard that, especially in the spiritist literature, if someone is not well versed in the spiritist literature, if they have a superficial understanding or they have a misinterpretation of what they're reading, they believe that for you to be spiritually evolved, you need to be poor, and that if you are rich, you are spiritually degraded. Is that so? Well, Money is the root of all evil. Now, have you ever heard of that before? Of course we have. It's a common belief that um, evil on earth happens because of riches. Uh, another sentence that we hear, that the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. So you have an impression that as few get rich, uh, the majority of us get poor. Is that true? Well, that's what we're going to analyze. Rich people are greedy, are they? Are all rich people greedy? Rich people are criminals. You know, certain individuals go to the extent to affirm that there, it's impossible to accumulate wealth if you're not dishonest, as if a prerequisite of acquiring wealth is to be dishonest, is to betray people. And then um, certain people would say, you know, the reason why I decided not to seek wealth, it's because I believe, I truly believe it was taught by my parents, by my grandparents, that you either choose money or you choose family. Because if you dedicate your life to family, you would not have money. If you dedicate your life to money, you would not have family. It's that so. Well, these are the certain uh, statements that we're going to analyze throughout our talk to see if they are really true. Ambition as a natural law. Now, when we hear that word ambition, we usually misunderstand or we confuse the word with uh, ambition with greed. Now, these are two different things. Now, what is greed? Uh, to a certain extent, greed is uh, our insatiable need for more money. But most importantly, we don't care who we step on to get to the money that we want. So that would be greed. Now, what is ambition? Ambition is a natural need to better ourselves. Now, I try not to use words lightly, and the word natural here has a very specific purpose. And what is that purpose? In the Spirit's book, in the question 676, we find the following question. Why has labor been imposed on humankind? In other words, we don't have an option here. We must work. We must labor. And this is the answer we get from the highly evolved spirits. It is a consequence of their corporeal nature. It is a means of expiation at the same time, a means of perfecting their intelligence. Without labor, humans will remain in intellectual infancy. Thus, they must owe their food, safety, and well-being to their own labor and activity. God has granted more intelligence to certain persons in order to compensate for their physical weakness, but labor is involved nonetheless. As we can see, labor is imposed in us, on us, in order for us to develop our intelligence. Without labor, we will remain in our intellectual infancy. So this is why we have ambition, a natural need to improve our condition, to improve our well-being. Now, when paleoanthropologists, they study our evolution, uh, usually what we hear is that we used to live in trees and uh, we used to live in caves and we were nomads. Uh, the whole purpose was just to Make sure we we had some roof over our head and we were protected from animals. But most importantly, we had to get to our food. And that created us uh, all these sorts of, that created for us all these sorts of needs, including the need to be moving from one place 
to another. That's what nomad means. We had no permanent resident residence. Now think for a moment, living in a cave, you know, how uncomfortable that is. We're living on a tree. Now, this is the age before foams. This is the age before beds and pillows and everything that makes our modern life comfortable. Now, how uncomfortable was to live in a cave? Now, let's say that we actually had food delivered to the cave, so we had food delivered to our to the trees. Have we have we ever had the need to actually come out of the cave if food was delivered to the cave or if food was delivered to the tree? I, we'll probably get so comfortable that we never leave the cave or the tree. Hence, because nothing was made easy and we actually had to come out of the cave and being at the cave was so uncomfortable, that were the condition, that's the environmental condition that we needed to develop our intellect, our intelligence, our ability to rationalize and make things better for us. And as a result, we came out of the caves and we had to go and find food. And by, and by having an effort to find food and hunt, we developed communication in order to get more help to kill an animal, for example. Uh, but just think for a moment, moment how tiresome it was for us just to keep moving from one place to another. And, and this happened for approximately 190,000 years in a period called Paleolithic Age, uh, the Age of the Stone, in which we're able to use stones in order to hunt. But then we came into the Neolithic Age, approximately 15,000 years, when we finally discovered agriculture. Now, this was a one of the most important inventions uh, of all times, agriculture, because now we're able to settle in one place. There, were, there was no need for us to keep moving from one place to another. Now, obviously, for agriculture to happen, we must have water. And this is why the most important civilizations, all civilizations were born near rivers. Uh, we have the China civilization that was born in Yang, near Yangtzeong. We had the Egyptian civilization that was born beside the Nile River because by controlling water, we can control agriculture. We can form a type of government of economic system and all this because we have a a personal a natural need to improve ourselves and that's what we call ambition so there is nothing wrong with ambition if you feel the need to improve yourself if you feel the need to buy something to make your life more comfortable that is a natural need a need imposed by nature in order to make ourselves feel comfortable. And when you look around, all living beings find a need to attend to this necessity. When you look at a dog, for example, what do dogs do? Well, they try to sleep in the most comfortable position. You know, if they have hard uh, wood floors and they have a carpet nearby, they have a tendency to go to the carpet. And why? Because that makes him or her more comfortable. So this need to buy, to change our environment is a natural need that we have to attend to. <clears throat> In the book Christian Agenda, there is this uh, very nice uh, story. It's located in chapter 31. It's called The Legend of Money. And in this chapter, um, it says that God created human beings and placed them on earth. And um, God quickly understood that people just wanted to be as comfortable as they could. So they were sleeping too much. They were getting lazy. Uh, they were not transforming the planet because one of the missions that we have is to transform our planet to make it more habitable for all of us. But they were not doing that. And that's when God decided to create 
money. And with money, ambition was born and the need to accumulate wealth was born. And that's how they begin to transform the planet. Obviously, this is just a legend. This is not the way it actually occurred, but it's a symbolic story to let us know that <clears throat> we have a need uh, to better our uh, physical condition. And that need, it's natural. I'm going to keep repeating that word. So none of us feel bad just because we want to get to more money. Question 785. What is the greatest obstacle to progress? Pride and selfishness. I'm referring to moral progress since intellectual progress is always occurring. Progress itself seems at first glance to double the intensity of these two vices by developing ambition and love of wealth. But here again, the love of wealth and ambition in turn incites person to pursue research that enlightens their spirit. So once again, we are reminded by the spiritist literature that money and the need to improve our natural environment, our physical state of well-being, that leads to intellectual progress. So you have a natural need to improve your physical condition in order to develop your intellect, your intelligence. And as we do this, we are fulfilling part of our mission. So. On part three of our talk, the providential usefulness of rich, we're going to be reading some quotes from chapter 16, page 325 of the gospel according to his spiritism. This is what we learn from that chapter. If riches are the source of many ills, riches per se are not to blame, but the human beings who abuse them. So here we have the perception, I'm so sorry, the perception uh, that money is not the root of all evil. Money itself, it's neutral. It's what you do with your money that can either promote you on the spiritual ladder of evolution, or it can degrade you. It can actually make you remain stationary on your evolutionary level. It's not money per se. Money is neutral. The gospel, once again, according to spiritism, give us this other lesson. If wealth could produce only evil, God would not have put it on the earth. Wealth, it is undeniably a powerful element of progress. Here we have again the affirmation from the highly evolved spirits that wealth is a powerful element of progress. And that is the sole basic of our talk of our talk this morning to show that wealth has its usefulness and we cannot leave without it as a matter of fact there will be no progress without wealth another saying from the gospel according to his spiritism humans have the mission of laboring for the material improvement of the earth it's a mission that we change the planet and in order for us to change the planet, we must have intellect. We must develop our intelligence. And as we do so, we keep evolving intellectually. And in the, char in the chapter called uh, The Law of Progress in the Spirit's Book, we're going to uh, understand from many passages that moral evolution follows intellectual evolution. We all need to evolve intellectually and morally, but we first do so intellectually. And then eventually our intellectual evolution will lead us to moral evolution. Another section here of the same page, necessity drove humans to create wealth, just as it drove them to discover science once again. We have the need to transform our environment, and that need was imposed on us. And as a result, that was the means by which we developed our intellect. You know, certain people always think, you know, why was not everything given to us? That is one of the reasons in order for us to develop our intellect, 
Because if everything is given to us, there is no opportunities for us to grow and develop ourselves. It is with great reason, therefore, that wealth is considered an element of progress. I'm quoting from the gospel according to his spiritism. And reason I'm doing so, it's because usually uh, there is this tendency uh, to believe that if you are wealthy, you're almost condemned uh, to the lower zones. You're almost condemned to suffer. That is not necessarily so. Being poor does not mean that you are spiritually evolved. Being rich, it does not mean that you are already condemned to the lower zones. It's how we use that money that would completely change our future. That is dependent upon the wise use of money. Well, if wealth is definitely a source of progress, if we need wealth to promote progress, then it's very important that we all consider uh, the systems of creating wealth, the systems of creating well-being. And we have, uh, in, in modern times, some competing uh, philosophies, some competing systems of producing wealth. And uh, most of you have heard of socialism and capitalism. Now, let's first talk a little bit about socialism. In question 811 of the Spirit's book, we find the following question. Is absolute equality of wealth possible and has it ever existed? As most of you know, uh, back uh, in the 1800s, uh, there was a man named Karl Marx and uh, another Englishman called uh, Frederick Engels. And these two individuals uh, wrote many articles on the philosophy of communism, uh, which led also to socialism. The basic premise is that all of us should have the same amount of money. Uh, that way, uh, we have no social classes, and as a result, uh, people will be happier. Now, when you say it like this, or when you read these articles, it sounds um, very promising. It sounds that would definitely create a paradise here on earth. Imagine no social classes. But whenever this philosophy was put into practice, it always have failed. Now, this is not my personal opinion. We can simply study history and where that economic system was applied. Did it work or not? No, it didn't. As a matter of fact, uh, socialism and communism was responsible for the more of 100 million deaths around the planet. It's a system that simply doesn't work. It looks beautiful on paper, but it doesn't. Back in 2013, I had the honor of being invited to the World Congress that happened in Cuba. So I spent a whole week in Cuba doing lectures throughout different parts of the country. Now, the people of Cuba were so beautiful, so uh, welcoming. Uh, we really felt their presence, you know, their, their reception. But the country itself, the infrastructure was a disaster. You know, I actually went to a spiritual center that the bathroom, that the bathroom was simply a hole on the ground, you know, no faucets of any kind, and no running water. And here we were, you know, all hugging and, and, and kissing one another. Obviously, we, we did so, but no infrastructure of any kind. You know, it, it, the country itself is stuck in an era of our evolution. And reason being, it's because it applied this economic system in order to have make sure that everyone has the same kind of well-being. And what we have actually witnessed is that socialism in Cuba did, in fact, made everyone equal. 
equally poor. It's a tragedy. Then on the same year, I went to Venezuela. Maybe some of you are not aware of this, but Venezuela is the richest country on the planet in oil reserves. And I have a good friend of mine in Venezuela who is uh, heading the Espiritus movement over there. And he tells me that there are no dogs on the streets. And why? Because people are eating dogs. No food. It's a, it's a lack of just about everything. So this philosophy sounds beautiful on paper, but it definitely creates uh, chaos. It creates poverty, and that's the only way it can all make everyone all equal. So what does the spiritist philosophy has to say about the idea of making us all equal? Well, it is. Alan Kardec had the brilliance of asking this question, although uh, Karl Marx's work was published just a few years ago before the publication of the Spirit's book. Question 811. Is absolute equality of wealth possible? And has it ever existed? And here what the highly evolved spirits, those who are in charge of making sure that this planet keeps evolving in the letter of progress. This is what they say. No, it's, it is not possible. The diversity of faculties and characters oppose it, this equality of wealth. 811, question 811a, nevertheless, say, asks Alan Kardec again, there are those who believe it to be the remedy for all social ills. What do you think of that? So for those who believe that socialism or communism is the right thing for society, it's because they think that by applying communism and socialism, all ills of society will be resolved. And what do they say about this? Either these people are framers of theory or they are ambitious and envious. And what is to be envy? To be envy is when you are unhappy because of other people's successes. They do not understand that equality will be quickly broken by the very force of things. Fight selfishness, for that is your social plague. Do not run after chimeras. So the highly evolved spirits, they go to the extent by affirming that socialism Communism is a chimera, is an utopia, is an illusion that is not possible to be applicable to our social lives. In page 326, Gospel According to Three Spiritism, we have the question again. Why are all humans not equally wealthy? Why are we all equally wealthy. Look at this very important, straightforward question. And the spirits gave us a brilliant answer. They are not equally wealthy for one simple reason. They are not equally intelligent. People are not equally active and industrious enough to acquire wealth. People are not equally moderate or foresightful enough to preserve it. That's it. For the highly evolved spirits, those who are in charge of the evolution of this planet, it's very clear that the system of economics does not work. And why we insist on this point? For the simple fact that those who are engaged in some sort of religious activity, they have a tendency to opt for this kind of economic system because it sounds so beautiful when you read it. But in practicality, it simply does not work. So in a nutshell, what is socialism? Well, socialism, since everyone should have everything on equal amounts, it removes competition. By removing competition, then you remove people's ambition to progress. For example, let's say in the classroom setting, a teacher gives a whole month of theory, and at the end of that month, he says, I'm going to give you an exam. And the teacher says, no matter how hard some of you study, no matter how 
less time some of you dedicate to studying, at the end of the exam, you're all going to get the same grade. Well, think for a moment. If you are a student in that class, and you are for certain aware that you will get the same grade, why studying bother to begin with? Why bother to study to begin with? And what will be the outcome of this uh, philosophy applied in the school setting? If we're all going to get the same grades, there is no point of studying. Therefore, there will be no improvement in knowledge gaining. There will be no point of research. There will be no motive to develop ourselves intellectually because at the end of the year, we all get the same grade. In socialism, there are no social classes. This is where it sounds so beautiful, yet in practicality, it does not work. Everybody should have the same. That's what we learn in socialism. And what happens? Everybody becomes poor. For those of us who have read the Andre Luis collection, uh, this is a collection of books that tells us about the spiritual plane. We have an idea by Andre Luis accounts of how the spiritual world is, is structured. And we learn many things from the get go. And if we apply our glasses of economic philosophy to interpret what we're reading, one of the first messages that we get is that in the spiritual world, people are not treated the same. People in the spiritual world are treated according to their deeds. For those who have applied themselves in this physical plane, when they disincarnate, when they leave their body, they are well received. They go to places that are very comfortable for them, physically and spiritually speaking, and at the same time, very welcoming. For those who have failed in their mission to better themselves and allowed greed and selfishness to be uh, the source of all their motives, of all their actions, they have produced a lot of pain. And as a result, where do they go to? They go to the lower zones. So these people are not treated the same. The same. They are treated according to their deeds. And are there classes in the spiritual plane? You sure bet that there it is. Uh, there are different classes in the spiritual plane. People who are more highly evolved, people who are less evolved, people who are uh, in need of moral progress in different scales of evolution. There are classes everywhere. However, in the spiritual plane, what makes you belong to this or that particular class, it's not necessarily the amount of money that you have, but the moral actions that you have stored in your soul. So this is why it's very profitable for you on a spiritual level and also on a physical level for you to help others, for you to promote progress, uh, because that guarantees your spiritual wealth. And it's very unwise for anyone to allow selfishness and greed to be the sole motive of their actions because that results in a lot of pain in the physical plane. Um, but another question that we actually get when people begin to study the uh, spiritual structure of Nusselar is, you know, is there money in the spiritual plane? Since this is a topic about wealth, is there such a thing as money in the spiritual plane? Or are we all given equal amounts of things in the spiritual plane? Well, first of all, we are not given equal amounts of things in the spiritual plane. Those who worked hard here deserve more. Those who didn't, they go to the lower zones. And in the lower zones, they are not there to be punished. They are there because, unfortunately, they have chosen the path of pain to awaken to their spiritual reality. They refuse to listen to love and the lower zone has the purpose of causing people uh, to uh, reap the bad fruits of their own sowing, not with intent of punishment, but with an educational purpose. So in the spiritual plane, people are not given equal things. 
And do people work in the spiritual plane? You bet they do. They work uh, very hard. And with that work, at the end of the month or the end of the week, of course, they're not paid in dollars. They are not paid in euros. They are paid with bonus hours. What does that mean? It's a kind of currency in the spiritual plane that gives you purchasing power. Now, for some people, this would sound so far-fetched. But remember, we learn in the Spirit's book that evolution happens in very uh, small increments. It's not a quantum leap, but rather small increments of evolution. And as a result, the uh, sphere that is closed is closest to our physical sphere. It has the social structure that we have here. It resembles very much our social structure because our personal evolution cannot have these quantum leaps. Everything happens very gradually. So in the spiritual plane that is closest to our physical sphere, our social structure is very like us. And as a result, we have money. We have currency. Once again, it's not euro, it's not dollars, but it's bonus hours. It's uh, the amount you get paid, it's the currency that you get paid with after you have delivered a certain amount of work in the spiritual plane. For those of you who have watched the Nosolar movie, uh, you remember that there's this lady who will who, go, who goes to the minister um, Genesius in order to ask to see her family which is a legitimate need. She wanted to see her family. She missed them. And uh, M Minister Genesis, uh, he said, he asks her, you know, how much work have you done here? And this lady, because of her laziness, because of her uh, social upbringing, people uh, did not encourage her to work at the Nasolar spiritual colony. She didn't work either. She was offered many job opportunities, but she always had an excuse not to work. As a result, the minister denied her the visit to see her family. Now, was he being evil by denying her to see her family? No. The reason why he denied, it's because, one, she did not merit. She did not deserve. And because she did not work, she was not prepared to actually help her family. You see, work gives us maturity. It develops our intellect and eventually develops our morality. And if she saw her family in those conditions without knowledge, without uh, moral development, without having emotional balance to actually assist them, her visit to her family would do more harm than good. So if you haven't read the book yet, go ahead and read it because um, it goes on even to the extent to affirm that with this kind of currency, bonus hours in Osolar, people even buy home in the spiritual plane. Once again, I, it sounds very far-fetched for those of you who never heard of this, but evolution happens very gradually, as we learn in science. Uh, physical evolution is very gradually. Moral evolution is very gradually as well. What about capitalism? Well, Capitalism encourages competition. And with competition, we have the motive to be better. Uh, once again, when we get better, uh, we also understand that we are not supposed to overcome our uh, challenger, but overcome our own limitations. So we are competing against ourselves. Each individual is given according to his deeds. So in a capitalistic society, we have a free market, meaning Create your own business and you can amass all the wealth that you want. And as a result, you create jobs. In capitalism, um, when it comes to equality, one thing that can be reassured is that in a system like this, uh, the equality of opportunity can be guaranteed, meaning children have access to good schooling, they have access to good education. And for those who actually take advantage of this opportunity, they can promote themselves socially by moving in up in the economic ladder. So you can guarantee equality of opportunity. But one thing that you can never guarantee is equality 
of result. And why? Well, that's because all of us are very different. We have different motive, motives. We have different intelligence. We, def we have different capabilities. And by giving everyone the same opportunity, the same education opportunity, you still create many differences just because each individual will apply those opportunities in a very different way. And in the capitalism, we had the existence of social classes, just like in the spiritual world. Uh, the biggest difference here between the classes in the spiritual plane and the classes in, this, in, in, in the physical world is that for those who are in the lower classes and they have no understanding of the purpose of being there or that it's their mission to promote themselves, they become very angry, very miserable. They envy the rich and they think that the rich is responsible for all social ills. Once again, I said in the beginning of our talk that this is just a summary of this topic. So I'm not here to delve into the whole consequences of capitalism and socialism because these uh, topics are very broad in itself, but just to give a summary. But in uh, capitalist uh, countries, um, for those who do not understand, that their mission is to promote themselves, they're very miserable. On the spiritual plane, however, people who belong to a lower social class in the spiritual plane, but they don't envy those who are highly evolved in them. They see them as an example to aspire to. They see that eventually by their own merit, through their own efforts, they will get to that stage. Here on the spiritual plane, it doesn't mean that, on the physical plane, it doesn't mean that our mission, all of us, is to become millionaires, but it's to definitely empower ourselves to develop our intellect and our morality. And in the process of doing that, yes, there's nothing wrong in amassing wealth. So, part five, challenges of poverty and wealth. Well, <clears throat> wise use of poverty. If you are poor, you know, how can you use poverty? in a wise way. Well, you can use poverty to build your resilience and your patience. Now, what is resilience? Resilience, it's our ability to withstand blows and yet we remain standing. That's resilience. And poverty has the conditions that we need to build resilience, which is a moral virtue. It's something that we need to practice, just like any other muscles in our body. In order to get stronger, in order to develop, we need to put into practice. And poverty gives us the opportunity to uh, develop resilience and to strengthen. And also patience. What is patience? Patience, it's our ability to remain calm despite our surroundings. And I can only develop patience uh, in that kind of condition. I cannot develop patience by going up in a mountain and meditating all the time because the mountain itself is very peaceful. It's amongst uh, the troubled ones. It's um, within the hardships and difficulties of life that I will develop patience. But we should not misinterpret this by thinking that if you're poor, you're supposed to remain, remain poor because now you need to develop resilience and patience. That's not the case at all. Resilience means that we're doing everything in our power to change our circumstances. And if they don't, we are not miserable for that because we understand that there is a spiritual purpose behind it. Same thing with patience. To be patient, it's not to lie down and say to yourself, I'm going to be peace because I remain poor forever because it's my destiny. Not at all. You're doing everything in your power to improve yourself. You're going back to school. You're getting yourself an education. You are doing anything within your reach to change your uh, well-being, your physical surroundings. Yet, if it doesn't happen at the speed that you want to, or if it doesn't happen at all, you're not miserable because of this. Because you understand that the earth is a school and you are enrolled in a particular class which you must get good grades on. Now, what would be the poor use of poverty? Well, if I'm poor, and here I am complaining all the time. I am miserable all the time. Does that mean when I disincarnate, when I die, I will go to a very beautiful spiritual colony because I was poor? Not at all. 
I have failed the class of being poor. I need to do anything within my reach to develop resilience and patience. So if I am poor and I'm complaining all the time, obviously I am failing as being in a poor class. Now, what's the poor use of wealth? Well, to attend to exclusively to selfish needs. If I have wealth and I'm using all that money just to attend to my needs, I don't think of anyone else. All I think it's about attending to my passions, to my material pleasures. Then that would actually excite my imperfections and I will fail in the class of being wealthy. What would be the wise use of wealth? To promote progress and help others. As a wealthy individual, I can do that. It's my mission. And here it is, question 902. Is it wrong to desire wealth with the desire to do good? So some people say, I wish I could be rich so I could do this and I could do that. Is this desire something bad? Such a sentiment is, of course, laudable if it is pure. So here we have part eight of the answer. It's very laudable if this is what you want to do. Nothing wrong with it. Uh, I repeat this again because there is this inclination to believe that you, if you wish wealth, it means that you are spiritually uh, not evolving. That's not the case at all. But obviously, their spirits, they place a condition on this wish. And the condition is, but is, is it such a desire always disinterested enough? Doesn't it hide a personal ulterior motive? Is it the first person to whom we wish to do good many times is our own self? So here it is, the condition. If you desire wealth to do good, there's nothing wrong with it. But they're asking us to analyze ourselves in order for us to truly be honest and say, do I want this because I want to promote progress or do I want this because I want to attend to my um, passions, to my physical need? And here are some examples of people who are very wealthy and they produce progress. Now, who is this man? This is Westinghouse, a very rich individual. And Westinghouse, he is the one who actually helped this brilliant individual here. His name is Nikola Tesla. It's a very interesting story about Nikola Tesla. When uh, Albert Einstein, he won the Nobel Prize in Physics for Relativity, he was asked, you know, how does it feel to be the smartest person on the planet? And Albert Einstein replied, well, go ahead and ask Nikola Tesla. That's how smart this man was. This man was a missionary of evolution. You know, in the uh, religious realm, we have a tendency to see missionaries as only those who are engaged in religious activity, like Mother Teresa, for example, or Mahatma Gandhi. Now, these are people that we respect very much, but are these the only kind of missionaries we have? Absolutely not. We have missionaries in all areas of life. We have individuals who are missionaries in the economic realm. Uh, Milton Friedman, for example, uh, this is the, uh, the, the brilliant man of Chicago Economic School. Uh, so many uh, prime ministers around the world have attended that school. And these people are born with the mission to create wealth for their country. Sir, I'm, I'm sure that certain of you might be hearing these words and it sounds very striking to you. You know, you keep talking about wealth, but that is what the lecture is all about. Wealth. We spiritists believe that the world is going through a transitional moment in which it will leave its aspect of trial and tribulations to be a world of regeneration. Can we actually sincerely accept that in a world of regeneration, there will still be, be people living under bridges? There will still be poverty so we can feel good about ourselves that we're delivering hot soup to these people? 
nothing wrong with delivering hot soup. It's a laudable effort to alleviate other people's pain. But in a world more advanced, we cannot picture poverty. Poverty is a consequence of a less evolved world, just like ours. And there are certain individuals who are born with the mission of creating wealth in order for all of us to benefit from it. Because uh, we have, you know, this past century, although we had uh, two world wars and we had many conflicts within countries, we are better in all different kinds of measurements that you can think of because of the wealth we as a collective being, our society were, was able to produce in the past century. So Westinghouse financed Nikola Tesla experiment. Nikola Tesla was responsible for the creation of alternating current, for the discovery of alternating current. He didn't create it, <laughs> he discovered, just like any other natural laws. They're already there, they just need to be unveiled. So, um, and Nikola Tesla had a intellectual dispute with another most, with another very important inventor, Thomas Edison, who fought for direct current. And the problem with Thomas Edison's idea is that with direct current, you had to build a power plant almost uh, every block in the city to make uh, electricity available for people. With alternating current, uh, you, were, you were able to distribute electricity at greater distances. And Nikola Tesla not only uh, discovered alternating current, but he designed uh, the motors to be used with alternating current. And as a result of this intellectual competition between Thomas Edison and uh, Nikola Tesla was finally uh, settled because Westinghouse was able to uh, afford Nikola Tesla. Nikola Tesla proved his point. And nowadays we all benefit from Nikola Tesla invention. You know, talking about being grateful. When was the next time you were grateful uh, to the existence of this man? Nikola Tesla, he's a missionary of advancement. And if you read into his biography, you know, he was considered kind of crazy back in his days just because he was such a visionary that he actually pictured the cell phone, for example. But think for a moment, you know, back in those days, we're talking about more than 100 years ago, it, talking about a cell phone. Obviously, you're not using these words, cell phone, you're describing the apparatus. What will people think of you? That you're a lunatic. And that's exactly what they thought of Nikola Tesla. But the problem with Nikola Tesla is that he had no financial ambition of any kind. He was a humanity benefactor. He wanted to give all his inventions to produce a progress for humanity. And as a result, he died very poor. There were lots of inventions that could move forward, but it didn't. So he had the intellectual uh, knowledge, but he lacked economical, intellectual knowledge. Another example of people who were very wealthy and was able to produce um, lots of progress is Andrew Carnegie. And Andrew Carnegie uh, owned lots of steel companies and he did so many great things. There are so many libraries uh, around the U.S. Um, he gave money to the Philippines to... Um, stop a war. Um, there are so many uh, halls around the U.S. that is dedicated to the arts. But one of the greatest stories that I like about Andrew Carnegie is the fact that he's the one who financed the Edwin Hubble uh, astronomer. Uh, he's the one who paid for uh, the telescope that Edwin Hubble wanted to build in California. And back in 1925, you know, I'm so amazed about these discoveries because until then, our perception of the entire universe was our own modest Milky Way galaxy. But with Edwin Hubble's uh, capability, intellect, with the help of uh, a servant that he had, he was able to detect uh, the period of a star, which after calculation, he noticed that this star had to be far enough, it could not be within our galaxy. And in just a matter of a couple of hours of studying and, and, and 
looking at this telescope that was afforded by Andrew Carnegie, our perception of the universe changed just like that because that star actually belonged to a different galaxy. And now we have the James Webb Telescope who are taking beautiful pictures of the universe. And that telescope costed $10 billion. And I'm sure there were many taxpayers involved in this, but also many private funding, private charities that was able to make the James Webb Telescope possible. And then you might ask, you know, what's the point of discovering other galaxies? Well, we are learning about the supreme intelligence of the universe. And if you have a complex of inferiority, that should make you feel very special because everything that you see in the universe belongs to you. And then you might ask yourself, why in the world then I don't have these things? Well, that's because if you're not able even to manage your personal life, how can you manage all the things? First, we manage our lives. Then we're able to manage the lives of all the people. That's our guardian angel. And then we know there are those individuals who are responsible for cities. These are our guardian angels in a higher level. And then we have those who are able to actually manage a whole country. And these are spiritual guides who are responsible for an entire nation. And then we have individuals who are responsible for planets. And that's how we spiritists see Christ. Christ is the co-creator of planet Earth because he managed to get to that level of spiritual evolution to actually co-create a planet. Co-create means creating with uh, the supreme intelligence because everything in the universe, it's in raw material. And as you develop your intellect, you're able to change the raw material for something useful. So we human beings, we create things for our everyday lives. Those who are superiorly uh, spiritually, uh, they create worlds and so forth. So seeing these pictures, that's what we're seeing, the power of creation of God, and that should make you very special. But if you have a superiority complex, then it should humble yourself. Because if you think you're very important because of your position, because of your power, because of your wealth, what that is in comparison with everything that we see from the James Webb telescope. And last, and definitely not least, the last individual I would like to uh, mention is Elon Musk. And who is Elon Musk? The founder of PayPal, the founder of Tesla, the founder of SpaceX. This is the richest man on the planet at the moment. And Elon Musk, who coincidentally coined the name of his car, Tesla, has what Tesla did not, Nikola Tesla did not, and that is economic knowledge. Uh, for those who are not aware, you think that uh, Elon Musk has a degree only in technology of some sort. He has a degree in physics, but also he has a degree in economics. And this is what uh, he was able to use his intellect to amass wealth. And what is he doing with his wealth? He's creating different companies. He's promoting progress. Uh, he has the Starlink, which has the intention to connect the entire planet. He has another company called the Neuralink, which is destined to help people with spine injuries walk again and do all sorts of things. So this is a man of progress. Uh, Elon Musk actually employs approximately 110,000 individuals. Just imagine the amount of good one person can do by amassing this wealth and promoting progress because more than 110,000 lives depends on the brilliance, the intellect of this man. So what should you do if you don't have the kind of wealth that Nikola Tesla does? I'm sorry, that Elon Musk does. But we can all do our part in promoting wealth. For example, the next time you go into a restaurant, don't think that you're going there and that you're paying for your food. You can actually think as the owner of the restaurant as being a benefactor. And this man is helping 50 people. There's a local diner I go to, and that local diner has approximately 50 employees. So when you sit down to eat and they give you food, think of it that you are actually giving the money to the owner in order for the owner to help 50 other individuals feel good about themselves because they are acquiring self-dignity through their work. You're not 
giving them just money on the street. And that could be very humiliating. But you are helping the owner of the restaurant produce uh, dignity in all these people by them acquiring their own money, their own means of survival. And in return of gratitude, the owner is giving you a plate of food. You can do anything you can to develop your intellect so you can use your wealth in order to promote your well-being and most importantly, the well-being of others. And that way, you can be very rich and at the same time, spiritually evolved so you can be well-received in the spiritual plane and continue your evolution with great abundance. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so ever much, Julio, uh, for bringing us some thought-provoking insight uh, into that part of our world which can sometimes cause us concern, but I believe with what you provided uh, can be less so with a different perspective on our parts. Uh, at this moment, we will open for comments and questions from the audience. From Paul Jacoby, is want versus need the criteria for use of wealth? If you perceive wealth as a tool and you try to act under moral guidelines, isn't balance the guide? Well, the thing is that um, want can actually be absolute. I'm sorry, need can actually be absolute. Uh, we all have the same kind of needs. Uh, we have the need for drinking water. We have the need for shelter. We have the need for protection. Want, on the other hand, is very relative, which means depending our social class, we want things that is of different quality because there is a need for us to uh, exhibit our social status and so forth. Um, one can also see wealth as being very relative because it all depends who we compare ourselves with. And as a result, uh, one can feel very poor depending on the country that we live at, depending on the people that we're comparing ourselves with. And then one can feel uh, very rich uh, depending who we compare ourselves with. So we always receive by God what we need, not necessarily what we want. Because what we want, it's not necessarily always useful for our intellectual and moral progress. As we keep changing uh, our wants, we also keep changing uh, the very fabric of society because now we create uh, indirectly uh, industries uh, to attend to these needs, and therefore I also help society in that way. Uh, there is great talk about material consumption and when is enough and when is not enough. Uh, what we have to keep in mind is that, you know, when we buy something, there is someone benefiting from it. We, we usually only think of the owner, but we're not think of the employees. If there are no items being purchased, how will the owner actually keep up uh, with so many employees? He or she can't. So in, in some way, we are helping, even if we're tending to our want. Uh, when will be the equilibrium for us to use our uh, material wealth, our needs are very different. Uh, a big uh, owner uh, of a gigantic corporation might need a helicopter to transport from point A to point B. Uh, if we are someone with uh, very modest means, uh, purchasing a very expensive car would not lead us to happiness, but we actually become a slave of what we have. So this is the uh, conclusion for the answer of this uh, sensitive question. Um, you can own anything you want. Just make sure that the things that you have, they don't own you. Two different things. If I am having to work two, three, four different jobs, just to keep up with the things that I want, do I really have these things or the things have me? Very good points. Thank you, Julio. 
from the U.S. Spiritist Federation. If we distribute any portion of our wealth to those without, are we interfering in their learning opportunities or are we giving them the ability to progress? Like I said in the beginning of our talk, this is just a summary, but if uh, you have the opportunity to delve into chapter 16 of the Gospel According to Spiritism, the spirits find laudable uh, to give alms. However, they encourage us to actually produce work, to create jobs. That is a way to give people dignity. So they are not encouraging us to distribute wealth, uh, just to give money around, but rather to help people uh, promote themselves by creating jobs. And that way, we're not alleviating them we're not avoiding them from the opportunity of learning. We are actually giving them a way for them to feel good about themselves because they're gaining their own wealth. And as a result, uh, they continue uh, with their progress. Uh, well, sometimes when giving the money to people is done in a very uh, unconscious, unaware way, it might produce uh, enabling behaviors in people who are supposed to be uh, actually transforming themselves. And this is why you should be very careful uh, with who you give your money to. Usually you hear people who, in a very um, naive way, they say, you know, I don't care what the person's going to do with my money. You know, I did my part in giving them to. Well, that's not necessarily a good way of seeing things. Because imagine if what they do with that money is to destroy themselves through abuse of alcohol and, and drugs. You know, I worked in the jail system for 12 years. And many of these individuals who were there, they were there because addiction to drugs. And guess to a point that you drugs take control over your discernment. You're not able to think anymore. Uh, so then you quit your job, you quit your family, you quit everything. And you're unable to uh, make a living. And that's when you start begging on the street. I'm not saying that every beggar is a drug addict. What I'm saying, I've saw a lot of them where I used to work at. And if these people had less money to use drugs, maybe their transformational point will come sooner. Very good thoughts for us to consider. Thank you, Julio. Again, from the U.S. Spiritist Federation, in the Gospel According to Spiritism, chapter 13, we have a lesson of the widow's might. The widow giving to the treasury, even though she was poor. How might we follow this example in our lives, whether we are considered poor or not? You know, most of Jesus' teachings should be looked at as from the um, relative context and, and not absolute. Uh, a teacher of Christ's caliber will not teach only for the people of his era, but for people from all eras. And this is why the teaching is given symbolically. What does that mean? A symbol is something that needs to be decoded. So a symbol is in a code form, and a decoder would actually break down that symbol in order to understand its messages. So if you take Christ's teaching, literally, most of them will be completely against natural laws. What this passage tends to uh, exemplify is that no matter in which position that we find ourselves in, we can be helpful. Because throughout our evolution, there is always this uh, war within us, a war of our need to improve ourselves and our need to feel comfortable. And something very important to learn is that you only grow when you feel uncomfortable. You don't grow when you feel comfortable. You only grow when you feel uncomfortable. So there is always this fight of us having the need to evolve and the need for us to feel comfortable. And in other words, laziness. So because of this need to feel comfortable, we have uh, developed clever ways to deceive ourselves, to create excuses for our behavior. And one of the excuses we could definitely have created if it wasn't for this 
Christ's passage is that since I don't have any money, I cannot help anyone. Only people who have the means to help has the responsibility to help. Well, with this Christ passage, we do not have that excuse. Because the widow's mite is the symbol that she only gave what she had. Well, certain people said, well, she had something to give. She had 10 cents. I don't even have 10 cents. Well, what do you have? You have your good humor. So tell jokes and make people laugh. You have time. Give your listening ear to someone who needs to uh, do a psychological catharsis. Uh, you have your thoughts. You have your power of prayer. You can pray for others. You know, I like to think that for those who believe that charity is only giving things, uh, they usually have a time of the week to give, which is, for example, Sunday morning on a morning soup. So for them, moment of charity is 10 o'clock Sunday morning at the morning soup. People who are aware of the importance of charity as a means to acquire spiritual wealth, they are aware that at any time of the week, they are able to amass spiritual wealth by distributing good. And how could this be done? For example, by the simple fact that you uh, go to uh, a bus every day, there is a bus driver inside that bus. You could name, you could call that bus driver by his name or, or her name. You know, uh, Mrs. Johnson, how are you? Uh, Mr. Clark, uh, good morning. Oh, thank you so much uh, for bringing me here. And by saying these things and calling people by their names, it do so much for their well-being. Usually when the bus driver gets into an accident, all newspapers are on this individual. This could be someone that have driven a bus for the past 25 years without a single incident. But the day he or she makes a mistake, everyone gets on them. Why not recognize this person's uh, importance in your life by telling them good morning, by thanking them for getting them getting you into your destination. Once you have a little bit of free time, you could tell this person how, how grateful you are in a more elaborate way. This is mites given from you. You're not giving money, you're giving of what you have, which is your words of encouragement. And that, my friend, at times, or I would say most of the time, is way more valuable than material wealth. Very, very good points, Julio, to remind us that our wealth is not physical, but that it is, uh, we have more than what we may realize and to distribute often. From Jean Santos, how much wealth does one need to achieve happiness? Alan Kardec actually answered this question um, in item 920 of the spirits book is absolute happiness possible on this planet and the answer is of course is not absolute happiness is impossible however relatively relatively happiness is possible and that's when we are satisfied uh, we with the things that we have although this satisfaction does not inhibit us from wanting more, but wanting more does not disturb us from actually being happy with what we already have. The difference is that there are certain people, they are miserable with what they have, and the wanting of more leads them to a constant torment. So uh, how much do we need to be uh, happy? Well, that's question 920, question 923, to be specifically that we can attend that we can attend to our material needs and once again every person has different material needs and that way you are experiencing uh, happiness without causing yourself torment because you lack certain things that's a matter of fact the definition of gratefulness uh, what is to be grateful is to be aware of the things that you have to the extent that you're not tormented by the things that you lack. Ungrateful people, on the other hand, they're so focused in what they lack that they don't enjoy the things that they have. They're not even aware they exist. You know, in these dynamics of being poor and being rich and being happy, we all we, we must be very careful not to allow envy and jealousy to actually change our perception of things. Once again, we have 
very deaf, uh, clever ways of deceiving ourselves uh, of these reality. You know, so sometimes you go into an airplane, and you know, most of airplanes they have that section for the first classes, and you look around these people holding their champagne glass, and what is the thought that comes into people's mind? Well, if the airplane falls, they will fall too. What is that a sign of? <laughs> Sign of envy. Why have that thought? <laughs> Maybe because you wish to be sitting there as well. And you don't have the financial means to it. You know, if you want to amass material wealth, if you want to promote yourself, one of the very key important things to do is to be happy for other people's happiness, and not to be miserable for other people's happiness. That's very important for us to grow financially and spiritually. It's a very good thought about not uh, tormenting ourselves for what we don't have, but uh, appreciate what we we do have, and which will lead us to a more peaceful life. So we have um, the uh, another question from the United States Spiritist Federation. How might we build our spiritual wealth in our daily lives? Can we ever be too rich in spiritual wealth? No, we can't be too rich. Uh, there is more, there's always more to grow uh, spiritually. And we can build our spiritual wealth by applying what we learn in the spiritist philosophy or any philosophy for that matter that help us to uh, grow intellectually and morally. And what is the law? The law is very simple. We have many, many books that gives us details of this law and how to apply it. But Christ, the co-creator of this planet, summarized the one sentence. Love God beyond all things and your neighbor like we love ourselves. Well, I want the best for me. Therefore, let me do the best for my neighbors. And in the process of doing that, I am loving God. Thank you, uh, Julio, very much uh, for the presentation today and for uh, responding to these questions. And much appreciation to everyone uh, who watched today's Spiritist Live talk and those who have been following our weekly uh, Spiritist Talk series. Before we close our uh, live today, I would like to remind everyone uh, the United States Spiritist Federation virtual course, Initiation into Spiritism, which is provided free of charge on Sundays at 10 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time. This is a self-paced course for those who would like to learn or review the basic principles of Spiritism, published by Alan Kardec. Please avail yourself of this great learning opportunity by visiting the course page on the USSF's website to receive the reminders by email. Now, Julio, before we close the live, would you please offer us a prayer? Yes. I would like to uh, make the final remark. Uh, thank you, Bradley, uh, for conducting this session so well. We thank also uh, the Spiritist Federation for the kind invitation and all those who are watching us to uh, consider that having this spiritist knowledge is definitely a kind of wealth. And with wealth comes great responsibility. And the question is, are we using this wealth according to our spiritual promises we have made to ourselves? Are we doing everything that we can within our reach to disseminate, to distribute this kind of wealth? Because it's very important that all of us have access to it. And with that, we want to thank God for creating so much abundance in the universe, abundance of peace, happiness, prosperity for all of us. And please give us wisdom if we are either rich or poor. If we are poor, to give us resilience and always encouragement to keep moving forward. And if we're rich, to give us the wisdom that we need to disseminate this wealth, creating jobs and opportunities for those who don't have, to have the means to amass their own self-dignity. But most importantly, we ask you, 
highly evolved spirits who attend to the spiritist movement. Give us all the discernment, discernment that we must have to apply these lessons in our daily lives. So be it. So be it. Thank you. And may you all have a calming and mindful weekend. Thank you for joining us.